Ahoy there, land lovers! Whispers in the Sea is an actual play series drawing elements from stories of fantasy horror, political drama, and swashbuckling action and adventure pirate stories. As such, a list of content warnings will always be made available in the description. Sailors, and welcome to another episode of Tales Yet Told, an actual play podcast dedicated to telling weird and fun stories full of imagination, thoughtful characterization, and inclusivity. I am your most humble of game masters, captains, and, well, uh, I guess I'm scrubbing the poop deck today. Name's Kendrick, or Kendo if you prefer. I use they-he pronouns, and with me today are the saltiest sea dogs this side of Kelodora, Gus. Generic pirate phrase, everyone. Hi, I'm 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 Gus. I uh use he him pronouns. I'm playing Felix again. But we're all fucked, aren't we? We're all just gonna die. Lots of people are dying these days, I'm hearing. Lots of people are dying these days. Lots of people are dying. Watch out for dragons in your <laughs> area. Folks. It's the new hip thing. <laughs> it's the new yeah. The God. new hip thing. Who are you playing? What's your... Oh, wait. No, you already said that. I already said that. Yeah, you already said everything you needed to say, so this is kind of on me. Yeah. Move on. You know who else needs to move on? <laughs> Hilda. <laughs> That's so mean. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was so uncalled for. <laughs> what? Move on. Hilda. Hilda, you need to move on. Hilda, we died. Hilda, you have to move on. I gotta move on, um, so I will not be introducing myself. I'm moving on. We're moving on to the next person. <laughs> no, Hilda, please. <laughs> All right, sorry. My name's Hilda. I use she, her pronouns. I am playing Avery, who uses he, him pronouns, and everyone's gonna be fine. Everyone's gonna be fine. I don't think you can guarantee that. That's an, an Avery guarantee. <laughs> I don't think I can give that. It's my deepest wish. <laughs> you know who else is my deepest wish? There's a gun to my head right now. <laughs> Ellis. Did you did you say that just because I'm here? Is that what every anyways? Um Look, I, <laughs> there's too much baggage around here currently. Right. You have I done this fully to yourself. I know. I yeah, I just want to say, Kendo, you locked yourself into this convention right. of, of the intro. How was I supposed to know that months down the line it would end up in this scenario? Anyways, hi, I'm Ellis. I was available, so I'm here. And I play Thorin, who uses he, him pronouns, and Eldorus, who uses she, her pronouns. I personally use they, them pronouns, which is fine, mostly. You just got them all covered. Then. I just try to cover most everything. That's gonna be a good one. <laughs> you know who else tries to cover almost everything? <laughs> Marceline. Uh, hi. I try to cover everything. I cover it up so the police don't find it. Yes, right? Rhymes. Um. <laughs> uh, hi. I use um they it pronouns. Um. Today I'm I'm playing yeah no i got a little something special for you don't worry <laughs> you're here to enjoy the love that we all share as friends and also yay. the deep dark horrors that i will unleash upon yay <laughs> of course 
Normally I play Bryn. I don't know if that's happening today, but that's okay. If I was, Bryn would be using she, her pronouns. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi. You might remember, audience, at the end of the last episode, uh, Bryn exploded <laughs> into like starlight or something. Yeah. Real shame. These things happen. Sometimes a character just blows up, you know, and you can't, that wasn't, I didn't even do that. I want to be so clear. I didn't do that. So you can't, I yeah, didn't even I, kill anyone. Yeah. Sometimes these things just happen. Bryn just turned into magic and isn't anymore. It's just fine. God, I wish you know. that were me. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> as always, Whispers in the Sea is playing Rapscallion by Whistler. Uh, you can find it uh, over on Magpie. Go get it. It's a fun game. Yeah, no, there's not really much else to say, except this is, without a doubt, the last of this season. I said that the last two times. Yeah, we did say it the last two times, but this time, I fucking mean it. <laughs> this is the last <laughs> time. I was like, real. if I have to kill everybody to make I'll this kill last, everybody I will. if I have to. Rocks will fall. Whatever and happens at the end of this session is the end of the season. Yeah, like, right? it's... That's kind of what we did for Strangers in the Wood, also, <laughs> where we were like, yeah, no, this feels right. I'll kill a thousand player characters before I let this podcast go on. <laughs> All right, we just, we got to get to the waves, folk. We've been holding off too long, so let's see what's at the bottom of the sea. Goodbye. Let the waves the claim waves, us. The waves. That's not, are we going to the bottom of the sea? That's not where yeah. we're at. <laughs> That's where we are now. Kendo killed us all. <laughs> It'll be the octopus's garden. <laughs> all right. That's where we are now. Everyone's at the bottom. And I think our camera fades. and. It comes back on a scene many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, on an island. The island you all just left, off the coast of Espinora, or, well, it wasn't Espinora then. The land that would soon be known as Espinora in the forest. We see a ethereal figure moving through it colors of teal and fuchsia and starlight glittering about her body, large and furry, not in the same way that we knew it or know it, but it's Aviva floating through the woods alongside another woman, standing somewhere around like 5'3", five, 5'5", five, five, wearing these black and gold silk clothing with big thick leather boots and an array of like pouches and like satchels and straps like all like all around her like kind of in the most like archetypal alchemist kind of deal where it's just like she's just got so much shit on her to like be able to like throw something together and like toss and like all of this stuff right I think in the back we hear like the sounds of like other people also moving through the forest with them as well as Aviva and Captain Tordinette and their crew make their way through the woods of this island. And I think our camera can tell from the way that we see Aviva at this point not having the blindfold, uh, even in this ethereal form, having her eyes uh, in her head being able to give her her sight. We can see, like, the full, like, expression of her face now, right? We can see that there is this curiosity as if she's being called through this forest. And as they make their way through the woods, eventually they come to a clearing, a lake beside a mountain cave. And uh, there, in this clearing, Floating above this lake is a figure, bright as the morning sun, but viewable. Marcy, describe to me what Bryn looks like in this moment. I think where those tattoos and rivers of light had originally ran through Bryn's skin are now cracks in her being. And they're is kind of just a vague humanoid form and shapes of body pieces that kind of 
move about and float as these um as the, as those same fuchsia and um teal um lights kind of fill the gaps and swirl around the extremities and at the center of the mass is a open sort of cosmic gate of sorts you can stare directly into that rift that we've seen several times of just that open expanse of space you see that uh is like the in in the body of this this entity um and at the center of it is just a very bright glowing light none of Bryn's features are there the head similarly to the chest is another open uh cosmic gate with us with a small light in the center Bryn's form is a lot was much larger than what we know her to be and Bryn as you are floating here above this lake, expectantly, having called them here, having called the Viva, reaching out to your connection with her, you see a younger, more, not naive, a more inexperienced Aviva alongside her captain. This woman whose face you cannot like this woman is like shrouded in like silks and and robes and such and really the only thing you can tell about her are all of these satchels and pouches and things she has on her that she's collected but you can tell the way she regards you with interest and uh, caution but not fear almost as if she has nothing to fear from you but aviva looks upon you with wonder delight and awe in the same way one sees the sun. And as Aviva approaches, almost kind of in the same way one would approach someone of higher status, a queen or regent of some sort. Greetings, dear my lady. I am Aviva, Wazir for Captain Tordelet. You have called me here. For what purpose? And sister, you may not regard me as your superior. We are equals here. Please stand. You see that she nervously, like, unbows herself and, and stands to her full height. She is just as tall as, <laughs> as, uh, as she is in her physical form. But there is still, like, despite that height, it doesn't have the same kind of intimidation or... Like, this is very much a person who is standing here in reverence to you. I think Bryn almost extends a hand, kind of almost, like, caressing the side of his face. You're beautiful, and I'm just as in awe of you as you are of me. Oh, yes, certainly not one such as you, so magnificent. Your very presence is enthralling. You, too, one day will be enthralling, but... That comes at your own experience and your own journey. For now, there's something more pressing at hand. I'm just excited I get to see the person you'll become and who you are now. Aviva sits there staring into the expanse that sits in Bryn's chest. In the far off distance, there is a comet in 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 that space, uh, moving incredibly fast. And it seems to start getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and larger and moving towards Aviva. And it's almost as it seems like it's about to break through the expanse, Bryn reaches into herself. And from that opening, the light seems to pause and stop. And it goes dark. And from inside herself, Bryn pulls out a large, black, ovular object and presents it to both of them. And it's the egg, the one that was sitting in the bottom of that lake. I think both of them look at it with wonder. And I think Captain Tordonet speaks up. And why are you giving us this entity of light? Are you like Aviva? There are similarities between us, for sure. But Aviva is nothing like me. Aviva is incredible in her own ways. More than I even know. Or herself. But that's why I bring this to you is because I believe there's no one more worthy in the world. 
And you know who we are. Are you insinuating that I wouldn't trust a pirate? She kind of looks at you in confusion when you say that. What's a pirate? You know that they go by a different name. Pardon my informalities. Parachkas. I believe I wouldn't trust a parachka. You call this pirate? Where are you from? Well, I am from now, and also a long time from now. A little bit of everywhere. But if you ask where I'm from, oh, I grew up in Belle Nui, which is like Aviva here. Uh, I think Aviva and uh, Captain Tournette turn towards each other like, what the fuck is she talking about? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> Belle Nui, another place that doesn't exist <laughs> <laughs> at this point in time. They were still part of the Empire, right, at this point? Uh, the Empire also doesn't exist. Doesn't right. exist, okay. Yeah. This is, so this is before This is so, the, I need to explain plug? how old this Aviva is. This is real old. Yeah. Aviva is so old. This is pre-flood then? No, this is not pre-flood, but this is like, this is like the age after flood. Like, this is, like... So, like, these oh. are some of, Haven exists, but yes, that's it. This okay. is, like, these are some of the first people out exploring the world once the waters recede. And then monsters are everywhere. Oh. Around. Like, that's how far back that's in time crazy. we are at this point. And Aviva goes, Sister, I know not of what you speak, but if you and I are similar in the same, then someday I shall be as great as you say. Then what... Purpose does this egg have in our future? And I think you can see she's like slowly, kind of almost like reaching for it unconsciously. Sister, this egg will bring about a new age of the Celestials. It will bring about all we have foretold closer to the gods that we've ever been. Imagine it, sister, what it would feel like to see a god. Of course. Yes. And her eyes, I think, widen as she just, like, is so, like, enraptured in, like, this egg, right? In this experience. And, like, just still, like, slowly reaching out for it. But, like, eyes unable to break from the egg. But I can see it. Our future. Our world. And I think Captain Tordnet hasn't taken her eyes off you. And, like, from, like, the shroud, like, you can tell there is this almost growing, like, not distrust. Because I don't think she believes in, like, this. I don't, I think she understands within, like, the celestialist, like, makeup of, like, what Aviva has told her. But I think there's a lot of it. She's like, okay, no. (laughs) There is power here, but I don't know what that power is. And sees this as some kind of extension of it, but is untrusting of its motive. And goes, so what would you have of us, then? Hold on to it. If you're willing, if you believe me, and you might not, long from now there'll come an age where monsters no longer roam the seas, at least as much, and parochkas are hunted rather than praised, were few and far between, and the world is growing dim, and the powers that be are trying to class down, and those who wish to build their own lives, free from their shackles. And this egg will help? As much as anyone can, but hopefully more so. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe it to be. Your legacy will die at the boot of an empire. (laughs) It'll take more than a boot to squash me, but fine. We'll take it. Aviva, grab it. And Aviva just goes, and takes the egg from, like, goes to take the egg from you if you will let her. And I think just, like, kind of holds it. Like, almost can't break eye. As she feels it's cold, strangely material in her hands, right? Despite her being ethereal. She just slowly, like, floats back towards Captain Tordinette, but is just, like, almost cradling this egg in her arms, unable to break concentration. And uh, Captain Tordanet kind of looks and like, anything else? Words of wisdom, lady. Almost kind of like beckoning for a name from you. Bryn moves forward closer to them. 
kind of glow, growing a bit darker in the way that she shines. Hold close to what you believe to be true and righteous, and hold even closer those who believe in you. Dark times are coming, and only together can we win and prevail and build a world that's worth living in. All right, then. I'll take it to heart. Is there something we should call you? Do you have a name? Or, you know, in case I need to tell anyone, you know, so I can quote you. From this day forward, you'll look in the sky and you'll see me. I'll be the standing God. And hopefully, when you need me most, I'll be there. You can call upon me. The standing God. And I think she, like, kind of curtsies in, like, a very sarcastic way. <laughs> it's like, ah, yes. <laughs> I think as this, like, conversation, like, comes to an end, Bryn, like, looks at Aviva and, like, gives, like, kind of last glance of, like, just admiration for who they are. She is still just staring deep into this egg. And as that happens, all of the, the teal and fuchsia light um, from the extremities starts to get sucked inwards into those into those voids and those pits. And, like, the, the light starts getting dragged and pulled in. Um, and as that happens, up in the sky, you start seeing sh- these streaks of fuchsia and teal growing insanely bright in the, in, the, in, the, in the sky, carving out this constellation and building this shape in the sky. The, the hole in the chest starts to grow smaller as all this light is drained through, and the constellations, the stars that build it up, start to glow brightly while these two twin lights are kind of entangled and swirling, connecting their line, their their dots, until eventually there's nothing. As Captain Tournette watches as you fold into yourself um, and watches as a new constellation is carved into the sky above, he lets out this whistle, you know, the whistle that people do when they're like, damn. Thank you. And kind of looks over to Aviva, who still, like, is, like, aware of things that are happening, but, like, so physically is so focused in this moment. And I think Captain Tornet just goes, I think you're going to turn to a star one day. And <laughs> Aviva goes, Though she be my sister in some way, I do not believe I shall ever amount to such wonder. All right, whatever you say. All right, uh, everyone... I guess look around, see if there's any more uh, ladies in the lake handing out things, I guess. Uh. <laughs> Women in ponds handing out swords. I was about to say, someone about to become the true, <laughs> true king of England here. <laughs> and our camera slowly zooms out as the rest of Captain Tordonet's crew begins to spread and look for things as... Tordanette herself and Aviva stand here at the edge of the lake with the black egg. And eventually, our camera fades to black. Our camera opens up on a flash of light, spreading throughout the space of strange grays and starlight and flecks of fireflies as stardust twinkles out of existence above the heads of everyone around this forest lake. Felix, as you are taking your first couple of steps out of the cave, away from the downed Captain Hano and the, uh, and well, uh, Katarina, who is still leaning beside her after you have closed the open wound in Captain Hano's chest, uh, not really healing any of the internal damage, but stopping her from bleeding out here on the cave floor. You uh, step out and see uh, Avery, harp in hand with so many bugs. 
just truly so many bugs. So many. Floating around him. And the water entities that were climbing out, still being held off by the large water absorbing things that he's created. You see Aviva staring into the air where there once was a Bryn and now there is nothing. You see Thorin lying on the ground far enough away from you, but near enough to the lake and the several story tall dragon still lashing out in anger and frustration at the new circumstances that it finds itself in. Lying on the ground beside you is the dead Captain Gabriella, throat ripped out by Eldora, who is flying above Felix. What do you do as you feel the last remain like the last remaining surges of Damien's power flowing through you? as you know whatever comes next is the end of your contract and the start of something new. Well, let's find out. I'm going to roll Dark Magician. Dark Magician. The last, well, maybe the last time we'll see this roll. When you wish to invoke one of your demonic powers, spend luck and roll plus Spitfire. How much uh, luck are you spending here? I'm spending two luck. And I rolled a nine. Okay. So I'm rolling 1d6 to determine what I'm getting. I rolled a five. Okay. Which is, for a scene, you may meld into any shadow you touch and transport yourself to another shadow within sight range. Also know that you can take a harm to subtract one from that roll to make it a four, in which case you get an Ashmodai, where you can create chaotic fireballs. And infernos. Now, again, yeah. taking that one harm, I does that put you in the black if you do that? It would, yeah. I also don't know if that's the the best thing to do right now. I think I think there's um maybe enough danger in the area already. Yeah, fair. Let me ask you this. Okay, yeah. Can I transport myself and someone else? I think in order to bring someone alongside you, you are going to have to, you'll, you'll have to spend bond with that person, whoever you are trying to bring with you. If you do not have bond with that person, you will have to roll. And there will be consequences on failing or even getting a mixed success on that roll uh, for either or both you and that other person. Okay. So I think Felix shouts to Avery and he's just kind of looking around he sees you know Thorin not doing great he sees um Hado not doing great and he just says Avery we need to leave now I'm working on it get over here get to the cave what what and he starts running for Thorin there's nothing in your way you can just kind of run straight there Thorn is lying, I, I imagine, like, on his back. Probably face down from... Oh, face down? Having yeah. washed up, yeah. Well, it wasn't so much you washed up, you got thrown off the back of a dragon. Oh, yeah. So... <laughs> Either or, then. Yeah, what, what do you... You describe to me how you think you look as Felix runs up. I think Thorin is... Has kind of ended up back on the shoreline... Uh, face down, just trying to get in a position to where he could do a low crawl in the direction of the cave. So yeah, Felix, you uh, run up on Thorin, who has slowly made his way onto his belly and slowly trying to crawl in the direction that you are running. As Felix approaches him, he just says, uh, not letting you die today. And um, he's going to try to try to pick him up. I mean, if Felix isn't like the isn't like weak, and Thorin yeah. isn't huge. I mean, he's he's muscular, sure. but he's five three. Yeah. So yeah, you you're able to pick him up with 
not like ease, but it's 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 not like uh it's not like an overbearing task to do so. Yeah. And I and I think he's gonna start carrying him towards the cave. I think as you are starting to like uh pick Thorn up and start making your way towards the cave, I think you see as uh the dragon, uh or uh you hear as the dragon like slowly like turns after whipping uh one of the poachers uh into a tree and calling out and it spots you as you were trying to like essentially like trying to escape and i think it recognizes thorin as the person who was on its back uh causing it so much and like honestly was uh for a de- like grabbing it by the horns and like trying to control where it was uh going and what it was attacking and you hear it call out where do you think you're going and it begins to rear its head back, taking in this deep breath. And uh, I think, like, as you look over your shoulder, you can tell, like, it looks like it's about to try to use whatever it's, what other games would call a breath weapon. What do you do? Let me ask you this. Yeah. Are we in the shadow of the dragon? I would say, yeah. This, this place definitely did get darker, right? From uh, the changes in time in this weird magical sphere. And, uh, I mean, even if the sun were out, you know, this thing is huge. So whatever light there yeah. is, is like, yeah, 100%. You're in the shadow of this dragon. So right before it uses its breath weapon, mm-hmm. in an instant, Thorin and Felix are smoke that dissolves into the ground where the shadow is. Mm-hmm. And they reappear in the cave amazing yeah 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 yeah. avery you see as felix uh carrying thorin uh over uh his arms is like trying to make their way back towards you uh and you see this dragon reel back and blow out this frosty plume of ice and cold winds that crash against the ground where Felix and Thorn were, and you see it leaves behind just this huge icicle spike of like that real anime, like someone has just used like ice powers to like like uh, the Elsa to, wall of like yeah icicles, exactly the yeah. Elsa wall of like yeah you see like these like spiky shards of ice uh and and frost like coming like out of the ground where uh this blast once was. And I think there's this moment where you're like, holy shit, <laughs> what happened? And uh, Felix and Thorin appear in the cave behind you with this smoky poof as they kind of take a step out of the shadows from behind of uh, the wall of uh, the cave. Cool. What do you do? Um, I would love to have my my two little squadrons of bugs that I have the ones that are the uh the floaty mat right now <laughs> and then the other ones that I just I think they were hornets or something recently that were attacking the navy or something yeah. like that uh I think you had turned them into uh some kind of I, I think they were like bullet ants that were like biting mm, them possibly and stuff. that I sounds think. like me yeah. so I want to take my two bug squadrons and the ones that were, like, the mat that's holding the egg, I would like to turn them into, like, thinking, like, atlas moths. Something big that can, Ooh. like, carry. And, like, they're just going to be a whole bunch of moths, and they're going to start flying the egg back with me towards the cave. <laughs> I love how much you're doing. Um, I will say, do, 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 having the moth, I think, Right now, it is uh, contending with the dragon that is currently here. Okay. The dragon being fairly riled up uh, in this moment. As far as the dragon knows, the dragon has killed Thor. It has no sense of they disappeared before the ice thing. Mm -hmm. I think the dragon is rather pleased with itself in that, but is now seeing that there is, A, more creatures that are moving, but also it is having this interesting pull towards this egg because of what this egg is that I think as soon as it like starts seeing like all of these moths start to uh, Give me one to, second to... then if I yeah, see the dragon looking towards 
stuff. Oh, I'll send my other squadron of bugs as um, fireflies to like to try to get all in its face it. and distract it. Yeah. Yeah, one hundred percent. I was gonna ask. Uh, yeah, this sounds like you're using a dirty trick, um, mm-hmm. especially now. So, uh, roll plus vinegar to get these uh, fireflies to distract the dragon while you move uh, the egg back towards you. A seven. Okay. Uh, I think essentially what happens here is uh, on a hit, your trick works. So I think the fireflies do like begin to uh, fly in front of the dragon's face and like trying to get into its eyes, blinding it uh, with their lights. Uh, it starts to reel and like try to claw at them uh, to uh, while it's trying to get towards this egg, roaring as it does. Uh, and I think the, the sacrifice of this is that this particular shwa- squadron of bugs these fireflies are, they are killed bravely. in the process. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think you notice as uh, they do, as like the claws rip through the clouds of these uh, glittering insects, uh, they just simply like, rather than leaving behind carcasses or anything like that, turn into mist uh, as uh, the dragon claws through them. Which also gets in the dragon's face. <laughs> which, <laughs> which only blinds it more. There you go. And you are able to get the mods to uh, pick up uh, the egg and uh, get it towards. Cool. And then I'm going to have both of us start heading towards the cave. Okay. Yeah. You see Aviva is still, like, standing here, like, kind of awestruck. She looks like she has just gone through, like, a very profound experience, at least for her. Aviva, are you coming with? Yes. Uh, you, You can see you, like, kind of calling out to her. Uh, snaps her out of it or at least like kind of brings her back into this moment as she begins to take like some steps towards you uh seeing everything we have to hurry yes i can i can close close off the cave get in and we'll like start heading towards you eldoris you're flying above you have seen what looks like thorin and felix get obliterated by this cone of ice released from this dragon's maw. Uh, You're seeing as uh, Aviva and Avery, uh, they have gotten the egg and are rushing back in uh, to the cave. What do you do as you're flying above here? This poor bird. Um, This poor bird. As she sees what looks like Thorin and Felix get dusted, she screams this horrible, terrified scream. And there is a part of her that I think what she starts to do, is she she almost starts to commit herself to death and starts charging at the dragon. And then upon seeing Avery and Aviva heading into the mouth of the cave, I think she wills herself to change course and just does a sharp dive towards the mouth of the cave. And as you come to the mouth of the cave, I think you see Thorin and Felix and everybody is able to get themselves into the cave as the dragon starts starts making its way uh, over there as well, calling out, You can't escape me! And like taking in that other deep breath. And I think of Viva steps in front towards the mouth of the cave as you fly in. And she takes her hands, digs them into the walls of the cave. And Avery, you feel the deep reverberations of the hum echo throughout this cave as. She just almost like pulls the wall closed in front of her, just as this rush of icy cold wind comes blasting forth towards you all. But to no avail, the wall is closed and you all are safe for now. And you're all here. Thorin just on the brink of death. And I think, Felix, as you're able to start to put down and to like kind of lean him up against the wall, I imagine. You feel the sharp pain as the briny, bubbling, dark fluid continues to seep deeper into you. You're going to take one harm. 
And with that one harm, I believe that does put you in the dark. Does. Then, here is what that means. Once you're below four health, which is sometimes referred to as being in the dark, you're compelled to be done for. Being done for means you can't go on, you're knocked out, or you're overwhelmed, or you're too exhausted to continue. You can uh, whisper, beg, and crawl, but you try to resist this compel as uh, being done for, which just means, like, yeah, you're, like, essentially can't do too much more if you fail. Um, yeah, he's going to try to resist it. Uh, whose rank are you spending to resist? Weirdly enough, as he feels himself nearly, you know, nearly dying, he, I don't think he's ever been this close to death before. And to everyone else, it looks like he's talking to no one. But he whispers to Damien. Mm -hmm. He says, this isn't it, is it? And the voice whispers in your mind. Oh, of course not, dear boy. No, 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 no. I won't let you go that easy. I have so much left. And you can feel the, almost like the smoky grasp holding on to you. Like, you don't see smoke, but you can, like, feel this kind of ethereal, foggy binding wrap around your arms and legs. Almost like splints keeping you steady and allowing you to continue moving. Or trying to. Roll this, uh, uh, roll this move for me, babe. Uh, 2d6 plus uh, however much uh, rank or however much bond you want to spend here. Oh, I can spend more than one? Uh, yeah, uh, when you stand your ground in the face of a compel, you must spend X bond with someone relevant. Explain how they're helping you overcome yourself and then roll plus X. So you can spend as much as you have or want. Okay. In that case, since I rolled a five, I'm going to spend two bond uh, <laughs> with Damien uh -huh. to get that up to a seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. So on a hit, you've escaped your vices. Uh, on a seven to nine, choose one. Um, you either take a weakness, you permanently lose rank equal to the bond that you spent, or you are in a worse position than before. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a weakness. I think you're exhausted, right? You, you. That makes sense. You, you yeah. are pushing yourself, and like, really, the only reason why you're still able to be up right now is because Damien is kind of supporting you through it. So, you all are here, safe. Katarina is still holding uh, Captain Hano. Aviva takes her fingers out of the walls of the cave, still kind of not fully here in this moment, so much is on her mind. How long will it hold, Aviva? The walls of this cave, they will hold for as long as they need. As long as the dragon can't burrow or dig, we should be fine. How long will the dragon stay? Or is it here now? I do not know. Either way, we, we can't wait forever. These two, and he, and he Felix gestures at uh, Thorin and, and Hano, these two need, they need more medical attention than... Any of us are qualified to give. Have you seen yourself? Yeah, I'm not at my best either, but... <sighs> I can buy us time. What can you do, Avery? How much time? Indefinite, honestly. And you see Avery, yeah, go ahead and, like, open up his satchel and bring out um, a leather-bound book. It looks different from maybe some of the other books that you've seen him taking notes in. This one seems a little bit more like well preserved like this is something that he really has kept hidden and doesn't take out unless necessary and he like steps kind of toward the center of everybody and says if everyone could get a little bit closer i think a physical connection might be best um so he'll like put a hand on somebody while he's holding the book in another hand and kind of, like, gesture for everyone to do the same. Yeah, I think um, Eldorus gets a wing under Thorin's hand, and then 
puts her other wing in Felix's hand. Felix hesitates for a moment. And he says, says, are you sure about this? There's another way I, I can I can take us through the shadows, but it's it's very, very risky. And I can only I can only take us probably as far as the edge of the forest. You've done enough, Felix. Let Avery go forward with this. Maybe for another time, Felix. You are spent right now. I think Eldoris reaches out her wing to you again, Felix. Felix nods. He says, okay, I just wanted to do more. We can, but we need to regroup first. Okay, I'm in. I'll offer my hand back to Felix as well. He takes it, and Eldoris is as well. I think Hanno's probably touching Thorin, and Katarina, of course, is also touching Hanno's. So it's just Aviva. Aviva takes a step forward and says, What is your plan? To go somewhere they can't follow. Regroup as necessary. Rebuild. We'll have to come back at some point, but it buys us time. If you want to get technical, you won't be leaving it. But I must watch over this place. There's nothing to watch over, Aviva. Please. Uh, give me a parlay here. She has been here for hundreds of years and is the only person who has been close to her in her life uh, has ordered that. And while you all are taking the egg, of course, taking the, the, the thing, I think she needs to be convinced for the first time in hundreds of years not be actively here. I don't think she has been able to let herself really accept that her watch has ended, you know? Can I, like, a plus one to Eldorus? Or yeah, yeah. If you have bond with Eldorus, you can spend bond. I think I do. Yes. I, yeah. Uh, so, Eldorus, uh, roll plus power. Wait, I'm rolling? Yeah, you were the one who did the closing. We can either see this as Eldorus is the person uh, who is who is trying to get her to do this or uh, being backed up by Avery or the other way. Is it like, do you not have any polish or anything like that? Is that the... I have plus one to polish. What do you have? Okay, that's that's all I have as well. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, this will just change who she has, I guess, who, who she is being convinced with uh, by and then also, you know, deepening of that connection. 10. Woo! On a 10 plus, they take your offer. The fates may offer something more, but you'll invite risk. I can't really think of what more would be here other than her just agreeing to come in. You know? <laughs> yeah, El Eldorish just wants everyone to be safe in the same spot. Okay, so she, yeah, she says, As long as you promise, we will be back. We'll have no choice but to come back. Eldoris is right. We have to come back. Okay. And she very hesitantly reaches her hand out. And uh, whose hand is she holding onto? I guess, is it Eldorus's feather? Maybe Eldorus's head, because both feathers are... <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Eldorus is like the connection point I think, people know. Got it. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think what happens is the black stone arm reaches down and just like a singular finger touching the top of <laughs> Eldorus's head. And Eldorus like leans up to do so. Okay. Everybody is connected. Yeah. Avery opens the book up and recites a somewhat notable phrase. Uh, Float away with me to a place beyond the sea where you and I can be free at the Driftwood Cathedral. And as he gets to that last line, I would guess that everything kind of just starts to go a little bit fuzzy in the background. And it's like, Nothing ever completely, like, goes away, but, like, it's like a, a fuzziness that then comes back into focus, and we're on the beach. You want to describe what this place looks like? Sure. So, as far as the eye can see in almost any direction, it is just ocean, except for directly behind us where there is a large, somewhat looming and imposing cathedral. It looks a little bit run down, a little bit, like, it looks all at once like it's been in ruin for a long period of time, like there's been nobody that's touched this in centuries, 
but not to the point where it is, it's not crumbling at all. It is still all there, which is like a strange dichotomy for it to have where all the stones are still in place, but it looks like it has been here for centuries and centuries yet untouched by like time. And all that is heard is the sound of the ocean hitting this small piece of land and a strange, almost hissing sound from everywhere that as you focus on it, you can tell that it's a bunch of conversations, a bunch of people talking and you cannot hear the words, but they're all there. Like a very quiet whispered chorus, kind of coming in and going out with the waves as well. As you all hear here and as you bring everyone into this world with you. Could I get you to roll plus Spitfire for me? Ten. On a 10, you all are here. You may be here as long as you want, and nothing else comes here with you. As you stand here, and if I, if I may add, there's a quality to this place that feels odd, right? Where I think it's hard to tell at first as you all find yourself in this new place on the shores of this island in the middle of an eternal ocean. As you rub your hands along the sand beneath you and as you look out into the water and gaze upon the magnificent looming structure that is the cathedral behind you, there's like a, like a parchment quality to everything almost as if the texture itself, everything is just very lightly kind of paper. Even the sky above you, if you're like taking like a real good look at it, you can notice splotches of like stained parchment deep, deep in the sky. Just like the barest hint of text. But you all are here in the book in a version of the Driftwood Cathedral. I think Aviva uh, is looking up and like around and like kind of trying to ascertain the quality of this place, trying to figure out exactly what this is and where she is, uh, as is like kind of Katarina. What, what about everybody else? I have a question. You said that all of us and nothing else came with us into the book. Can Felix feel the presence of Damien? I guess that's a question, huh? Avery, mm -hmm. would you have let Damien in? I don't trust Damien. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. No, that's no, that's so fair. Uh, then I would say no, Felix. You cannot feel Damien's presence. I have something I want to do. For the first time in many years, mm -hmm. not feeling the the presence of Damien, Felix kind of drops to his knees. And he closes his eyes and he is sort of, he's feeling the last bit of magic within him. The last bit of Damien's power that was, that was there. And he's just going to let it go. And what effect that has is going to be determined. And I hope it's what I think it is. Let's hope what it is what I want it to be. Okay, so are you doing the Dark uh, dark Magician? I am. Yeah, how much luck are you using for this? I am using two luck. The last of my luck. That roll is a 13. All right, on a 10 plus, you choose which of those you want. Okay, let me DM you real quick. <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. Oh, yeah, sure. Cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not worrisome. I'm so interested in what your end goal is. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, why not? I mean, there's no reason, like, I, uh, you have that move. Um, took this move not knowing what I was going to do with it. Yeah. And I want to use it at least once. Yeah. And I just had this idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, okay, I'm super down for this. Question, do you want this to be a thing that happens right now? Uh, as far as, like, do you want this to be a thing that, like, narratively is happening right now, or do you want to save this for potentially your solo? Let's do that. Okay, awesome. So for right now, Felix is just sort of meditating on this on this magic that he has left in him, and 
Yeah. Okay. So, you all are here. Felix, you are beginning to meditate on the dregs of Damien's power. Thorin, you are in, like, the flickering, like, coming uh, in and out. Find yourself now lying in sand on this beach. You hear the sounds of the waves and all of these people, your crew, your friends around you. Eldoris. Am I still injured? Like, I'm still super fucked up, right? We're just in this book now. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think there's an important thing here. I think you feel this kind of dull pain where you can tell that your body is beaten and broken in a lot of these ways, but it feels like something that's so far off, you know? I think we see Thorin slowly kind of get up from being laid down face down on two hands and knees, and then finally just kind of fully coming to sit on his knees. And he looks up and he looks at everyone. And he, I think he also looks down at Hano, and I imagine she's kind of laying down and he, he puts a hand on her just gently. But then he keeps looking around and he asks, where's Britt? And he's just staring at you all. You see Avery kind of look down, not meeting your eyes. Just seeing that. Oh, my God. And he hangs his head and just kind of slumps down next to Hano. And now Doris comes and sits in his lap. And I think he just goes quiet. Aviva chimes in. There, there is, is nothing, nothing to, to worry, worry about. My, my sister, Brie. I do not know by what machinations other than our own power, but she has become something new. I do not entirely understand myself. But she's gone. She is gone, yes, in a way. I think he gives a slight nod to to Aviva. It does end up just looking back down, I think, and uh, just petting on Eldorus and rubbing... uh, Hano's back a bit. I think Aviva slowly comes over, sits down, and in the center of all of you is this egg, right? The black egg, this thing that you all came here for, right? The thing that started this adventure and led you all here. And I think Aviva just kind of crosses her two arms and sits there kind of vaguely, like, you know, looking in the direction, right? She can't see visibly, like, with her eyes, but I think the black arm attached to her shoulder reaches over and just kind of lightly grazes the shell of this egg. And now that all of you can see it, it is this dark stone, almost, well, I mean, I think all of you have seen bits and pieces, right? You've seen shards and arrowheads of the stuff right? This is a meteor of some kind in the shape of an egg. The same material that Aviva's arm is made out of. And as her hand kind of brushes alongside of it, tilts her head thoughtfully. Why did she bring it to us? Avery, you are here in the Driftwood Cathedral, or, well, your version of the Driftwood Cathedral, hidden in the spaces between the lines in your very packed journal. It is a space that you've become familiar with over your time writing about it, researching about it. It is but a reflection of what you imagine this place truly is, based on everything that you've learned, read, and dreamed about it. As you walk along its parchment shores, what is it that draws your attention most? About the island, about the endless sea, about the cathedral itself? I think just... 
the vastness of everything around me because I've been in this book from time to time, but like I've generally been very busy and not been in and in front of the whole conception itself. And I think when you put everything together and it is made a reality around me, it's just so much more overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You can look at, you know, pieces of the puzzle and study and be like, I know that this is true and I know that this is true and people have said this and that, but when it all is like combined into the structure that is in front of me and the endless sea around me, Mm -hmm. I think it's just an overwhelming and somewhat imposing place, even when I know it's a fiction. Of course. I mean, as you said, the cathedral is vast. It is, in many ways, familiar. The large spires and grand archways of its almost gothic design reminds you a lot of the Grand Cathedral in New Haven, the home of the Church of the First Song, the home of the Dirge Eterni, the place that you have spent a vast majority of your life. But it is different in many ways. Its angles sharper. Its material, despite having this parchment-like texture from being in the book, has the semblance of rotting wood, but with new growth still, dying and birthing at the same time. As you make your way through its imposing entrance, the doors of it almost broken off of its hinges, leading into a vast and echoey chamber. What do you do? So I would like to, yeah, I'm coming in through these large doors and I want to go up, like, further into the nave of the church. Mm -hmm. Not all the way up to, like, where the altar area Mm -hmm. would be, but, like, up into where the pulpit area would be also. Yeah, understood. Yeah, and as you are walking through and looking around this place, again, the shadow of familiarity dawns on you. Its architecture and the way in which it is set up is very similar to the Grand Cathedral, but it is, again, different in so many ways. The uh, pews that make up this uh, this chamber where you would imagine the many people who would come and sit, pray, and worship here aren't the fine mahogany crafted pews of like fine, uh, like (laughs) fine cloth cushioned seats. They are old wooden benches that are broken apart and worn by centuries of use. The altar itself, not this grand dais of marble and gold trimming, it is a simple wooden stand, almost a like a piece of driftwood just put on two legs here, draped in rotting cloth. What would I know about uh, the Watcher who would reside here, and what of that would translate into my book? Interesting. So you know that the Watcher is the Lord of this domain, or the real version of it. They who watch the landless sea and the Driftwood Cathedral, the one who looks over the lost dead and beckons them here to the cathedral. I guess I'll leave it up to you. Is there a version of the Watcher that watches over this space in your journal? Do the notes of the Watcher that you have manifest here? I mean, I feel like everything else does that it would have to be the case with the Watcher as well. Mm -hmm. Everything else that I've written about the church and about the landless sea, like 
yeah, I, I guess the there is a shadow of the Watcher also in my cathedral. Okay. Then my question is, what does Avery think of the Watcher? Avery doesn't know what to think of the Watcher. There's not a lot of information out there mm-hmm. about the Watcher. Most of the information that he even knows, he has gleaned mm-hmm. from his brother, I believe. Yeah. And so maybe a slightly tainted view of the Watcher, but I don't think he views the Watcher as intent inherently malevolent or inherently benevolent. Benevolent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They are the Watcher. They are okay. there. They see. Okay. Everett's thing hasn't happened in this universe. Everett was a rememberer, but not in but didn't have that whole interaction, right? Everett was a rememberer. Was slash is? Oh, man, I, I haven't really, I'm gonna be honest, I haven't really I know. thought, I haven't about, thought about, about what it either. He, what his present state is. I mean, I guess what do you think is more interesting for you to eventually interact with? Do we want the version of Everett that is still a rememberer? Or do we want the version of Everett that used that power for their own gain and uh, was punished because of it? What Ooh. do you think is more interesting for you to have to eventually interact with? I think, I think let's say, like, current. Current, remember it. He is attached to the cathedral. He is under the Watcher's jurisdiction somewhat. Yeah. And I think that can kind of prompt, like, why Avery is so invested in this as well, because I Everett doesn't know much about what he's been in, involved in, maybe. And that is why, like, Avery is so intent on, like, learning more about it. Yeah. Not just for knowledge's sake, but for also, like, helping his brother. Yeah. Then I think your view of the Watcher is a very neutral one. You know them as an entity that watches over their dead and also, on occasion, tasks people to be the person to remember them in the living world. And so I think the way that it potentially manifests here, um, and add and subtract from this as much, um, is that the way that I think it manifests is that while you are in the grand chamber of the Driftwood Cathedral, walking amongst its rotting wood and pews, you feel it, the ever-present stare. You have that feeling of being watched, of someone just over your shoulder, walking alongside you as you walk here, and when you turn to look, there's no one there. Yeah. It is not a physical presence for you here in this book. It is not one with a voice or an ego or it is it, it is barely a person it is just this feeling yeah of being watched yeah i think that that's what avery basically knows about the watcher is that the watcher is there and presides over this cathedral and yeah interacts with the world and people at times to help facilitate that remembrance and watching but yeah he doesn't have any form or any like voice to put to it even though Avery knows that those are things that the watcher has based on his reports from his brother it's not something Avery is able to conceptualize and thus is not here in that way but yeah definitely like there is a presence that is around and in this cathedral that yeah represents what that watcher is Doing and it's probably why Avery doesn't really spend very much time in the cathedral. Yeah, it's pro- it's notes. probably very unnerving to constantly yeah. have this feeling like not even just like it's not even just like the paranoia right of being watched. It is like a bodily sensation of there is someone over my shoulder watching me and then turning and not being there. Yeah, and I think a a, a deep seated like paranoia, fear, whatever you want to call it, that Avery has always had about this world in his notes is that by knowing of the Driftwood Cathedral and the Watcher's existence has already just, like, made it part of 
mm-hmm. the real one's jurisdiction. Like that mm-hmm. that feeling is actually the watcher mm-hmm. because you've invited that presence, basically. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't know if that's true, but he doesn't particularly want to mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. find out. A wonderful gift you've given me. Mm. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so as you are walking here up to the pulpit, what does Avery do? I think, I think Avery is just kind of cataloging everything again. It's all, again, things that he knows he has placed these things here basically in his mind, but like looking, you know, back from like the stairs and seeing all of those pews or like seeing you know, windows that maybe would house, you know, like stained glass, but just like, ooh, actually, can instead of it being like a stained glass collage, it's like sea glass. It's just... Ooh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. It's sea glass, which, again, is different colors than, like, anything that would be at the... It's not clear. It's, like, yeah, it's got this really... It almost gives you the feeling of being underwater. Oh, yeah. Like, the way that it's reflecting the light. Mm -hmm, Yeah. mm -hmm. And it's surprisingly, like... I think... Okay, wait, I don't remember if out on the shores... Is yep. that where you can hear, like, the whispers and, like... Yes, the, yes. Out on the shores, the you can hear the and whispers. The, and yeah, the songs and whatnot. I think it's all very strangely muffled in here. Mm-hmm. As if you were underwater. Yeah. <sighs> That's so good. <laughs> so, yeah, I think he's, he's in there partially to yeah, have that muting effect, but also just, like, to explore these things that he's put in place and, like... Mm-hmm look at it as a whole. Yeah. And you walk through the many halls in between the pews and just dark rooms and, uh, and, and, and forgotten corners of this place that are for the most part empty, right? Because you, who, how is Avery to know what is in these rooms? Yeah. It is a lot of empty halls and a lot of empty rooms and a lot of empty passageways that, Avery can imagine, but truly has no real idea of what may be in the Driftwood Cathedral. Yeah. Um, I think once I get to the front, yeah, can I, can I just, I don't know, this is a weird question. Is there anything to like investigate or like look into? Because it's, I mean, I guess it's all stuff that I've, yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, it's also, yeah, it's, like, all stuff that you've written, so there's not a, like, is there anything here that you don't know is here? I guess there's not, but there could be the fact of, like, having all, you know, again, all these disparate puzzle pieces that are kind of forced to come together Yeah, if there's a bigger picture to be seen in any way. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Yeah, uh, roll your investigate move. And let's see, it, what, what is it specifically that you're looking for, I guess, or trying to glean from this? I'm trying to glean, like, not exactly like a, like, good and evil sort of deal, but, like, I'm mm-hmm. trying to glean just something about, like, is this place an okay place to be? Like, is this something mm-hmm. I should be worried mm-hmm. about or I should be wary of or is it you know truly the neutral place that I've viewed it as especially knowing that like Bryn had a very different view of this place than I did and that Bryn was intent on like destroying it and I'm Mm -hmm. like is this a place that needs to be destroyed or am I is is it is there different views yeah understood okay uh roll plus vinegar okay that is it's a nine yeah that's a nine okay on a seven to nine you get to ask one of those questions all right yeah is there something dangerous here what and where is it okay or mm, should i do dangerous or hidden Mm, two very interesting questions two very different (laughs) but different but but like the same but also Yeah. yeah i'll get i'll go with yeah is there something hidden here mm-hmm. is there something yeah hidden in these pieces to give it a greater meaning mm-hmm, mm-hmm. let's see as you were exploring 
your version of the Driftwood Cathedral, hearing the drowned out whispers and singing of those who are lost outside of it and lit by the murky sea glass windows of the cathedral. You make your way back into the grand chamber up near the pulpit and its strange, simple altar. You hear something. It's muffled similarly to the voices that are outside, but muffled in a way where it's not like this isn't a distant sound that sounds like it's coming from underwater. This sounds like a sound that's being like muffled almost like by like a bag, you know, when someone like, or like when like someone puts like their hand over their mouth and they're like, mm-hmm. are still trying to talk. Uh, and you hear a, <laughs> and it's coming from the altar. I'm going to go up to the altar. As you go up to the altar, you notice something for the first time that you hadn't seen underneath this kind of like, rotting cloth that's over the altar is the shape of a book that's just like underneath this cloth. And as you pull it off, you see this old leather book, bronze, uh, like kind of uh, uh, clasps or like uh, kind of uh, binding, you know, at like the corners of it. Um, a uh, very like decorative and like detailed like uh, leather like uh, like a design over it, incredibly intricate, with uh, this like kind of faded golden leafing on it that's like kind of peeled and uh, worn down by the ages, and a clasp on it where there can be a lock on it, but there isn't. But the book is closed and. You still hear the voice coming from the book. Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to take the book and I'm going to open it up. As you start to unclasp the book, you feel it begin to rumble and shake uh, uh, in your hand. And as you get the clasp off, the book throws itself open out of your hand back onto the table and kind of like, (coughs) (coughs) well, thank you, Avery, my boy. (laughs) Couldn't get that latch off myself, but with you around, I suppose I didn't need to. How are you doing, old boy? Who, who are you? And Avery, I think for the first time in a, a while, things have been super busy over the past uh, bit. Um, that I feel like the feeling of the hum has kind of been kind of in the back of your mind. It's something you've become quite used to, I, I imagine, over these uh, couple of days, especially being around Bryn and Aviva and everything that has just happened. I think that you've been kind of thrown headfirst into the exposure of the hum that as of this point, it's probably kind of faded in the back a little bit for you. But in this moment, as this strange talking book has uh, kind of revealed itself to you, I think the feeling of it becomes quite prominent again. Not in the same way as where you were feeling it, where it was coming from everything but it's very specifically for you in this moment coming from this book. I would like to try and pick it up again. It lets you. There's, oh, <laughs> okay, all right, being a little handsy, but that's totally fine. I'm going to start flipping through Okay, I, I, okay, and you're, as you're doing that, it's like it, 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 um, you start flipping through pages and there is a language in this book that you aren't familiar with. Um, there is... What? What you, are you? you? What are you doing in my? What do you? What do you mean? What am I? What am I doing in your notes? Uh, you put me here. Oh, Avery. <laughs> okay, okay. I see things are getting a little confusing. <laughs> I suppose. I, just uh, think of me as a friend, because that's what I am. I, I am a friend indeed, and I am here to aid and support you in anything that I may be capable of. Now, I should be. I guess a bit more specific on that. I can help you with things that I know. (laughs) And that's anything in the contents of this book, I suppose. So you know what I know. 
Oh, uh, well, I mean, I know things that you don't know. We're not the same person, obviously. Oh, all right. Um... Come on, ask me a question. Why are you humming? Why am I humming? Oh, that's because that's where the hum comes from. Everything. So, technically, uh, I'm humming because everything has a hum. But I might specifically be humming for you a bit more uh, noticeably. Uh, because, well, perhaps you need me in this moment. I know that's a bit vague, and uh, it's... I wish things can be more specific. Sometimes there are things that are just vague, and we do have to learn to live and understand with it. But think of the hum as the thing that makes things be, right? Okay, we have All that. Right. So if the hum is what makes things be, then our attunement to the hum and the various things that find themselves attuned, be they uh, animals, be they spirits, be they celestialists, be they whatever, they are attuned to those things because those are the things that help them be. Does that make sense? On a level, sure. Right, I, okay. Okay, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm still lost as to who you are and what I, how I have come across you. <laughs> well, that's easy. My name is, and there's this moment where you can tell that the book is still talking and mm -hmm. saying something, but it doesn't come across to you. It sounds like you just get hit with this sudden burst of like someone took a cathedral bell. Let, let's say you were the person who has to ring the bells. It sounds like you hearing the bell that you just rung up in the tower right next to your ear. A loud boom, just like deafening roar of a cathedral bell. I, I drop the book and stab you back. Hey, oh, be careful. <laughs> I may be a book, but I do feel pain. I'm not to know who you are then, I suppose. Well, of course you are. I just told you, my name is... Doom. Nope. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry, Avery, old boy. Is it, uh, huh, peculiar? I so you're saying when I... Sorry. Be able but... to know. No, I, I... Please don't say it again. Um... Can you describe the feeling that you're... Like I've, I've rung a cathedral bell above my head. Fascinating. I don't know why that would be. I don't either, but let's not keep doing it for now. Um... Of course, of course. Huh, is there something that's stopping you from being able to hear my name? Or perhaps you are not allowed to know my name. Or have I forgotten my name? Did I say it and only sing a bell ring? No, that's silly. I know my name. It's... And then do <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> oh, sorry, Avery, my boy, I, I forgot. Uh, I will close the book again. Oh, please don't close the book. It, I, I do enjoy the ability to talk to you. I suppose I've been waiting to do so for so long. It's uh... well, we will, I suppose, work on that. Ah, uh -huh. of course. Ah, uh, yes. I hope there is a day that you will be able to know who I am, as it feels. I don't know, I guess I've been waiting for this moment to be able to finally speak uh, and see you when you see me and speak with me, but I, I, uh, I don't know. We'll there come up with a, an intermediary name yeah, to no, use for sure. in, in lieu of your, your true one. I'm, I'm sorry, but... Uh, oh, yeah, no, that's we'll fair. You it. just won't know my name. That's okay, I guess. I will endeavor to know it, but that seems to not be the case right now. Understandable. Yes. <laughs> ah, yes. Well, 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 one must continue to move forward, of, of course. Uh, one day, adventure shall lead us to a place where maybe uh, you'll learn my name. Uh, or uh, we'll and find something. And won't that be a true uh, adventure? Yes. A true adventure indeed. Of course, you've been on many of those recently. Well, thank you. This has been a strange interaction to have in my book, <laughs> but... I will endeavor to understand it as I endeavor to understand all things. And that is what makes you Avery and what makes you wonderful. I'm going to just like, <laughs> I'll put the book back on the table so that it's not on the floor. Like mm -hmm. I accidentally, you know, scattered it. I'll put it back on the table and I'm going to just uh, go back to sit in like 
one of the back pews and yeah. I'm just going to start writing. <laughs> yeah. As you are walking away to start writing, writing the book goes, oh, oh, okay. Uh, you're just going to, oh, you're leaving me here. Okay. Uh, uh, that's a, uh, no, again, no, please. Th there has been a lot of things. I'm sorry to. Oh, no, I understand. I understand. You have to process it all. <laughs> Uh, you seem to know to me well, and you shouldn't be surprised by this. No, I'm not surprised at all. Maybe <laughs> just a little disappointed, but that's okay. Uh, oh, okay. No, it's no, no. I, I get it. You're, okay. you're you're going to do your thing. I did not mean to. I'm not trying to put any guilt on you. I'm sorry if it seemed that way. I just uh, it's a little. I, mean, I don't want to disappoint. I I I have no. in my mind just met you. I know. I, I understand. No, I understand. I've known you for your entire life, and you've known me for five minutes. I just go. <laughs> <laughs> That's too much of a mind fuck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And you go to Amazing. one of the back pews and you pull out your things and you start writing. What do you write? A letter to Violet. Violet, I've made such a discovery I can hardly believe it. I won't detail it here as we know how quickly things in writing make their way around the Morgan household. But suffice to say, our suspicions were well-founded. Perhaps not in a way we could have predicted, but certainly and profoundly well-founded. You may want to dig a bit, though I'm sure you're quite busy with your upcoming nuptials. I will, of course, make it back for the event. Alice is obviously eager enough for our own as well. See to it that your teddy is treating you well. Give everyone a hug for me, especially Sarah. With love, Avery. Thorin. You are here in this book that Avery has been carrying around and has kind of transported all of you in here. You know, Avery's version of the Driftwood Cathedral. I, I don't know if you really know the... I mean, you definitely don't know the mechanics of it. Uh, no. Nobody knows the mechanics, but I guess like the... like what this place is, you know? I guess... I have a vague mythology of it. Um, yeah, and a lot of questions for sure, but beyond pondering within his own fairly vacant understanding, it is, it's only a guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And e even then, like, this is just Avery's version. Exactly. Of it. So, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So beyond that, you are here, you and Eldorus are yeah. here, obviously, beyond where you are. All of your companions uh, have kind of already split up. You see that uh, Avery has gotten up to go kind of explore uh, a little bit of the cathedral, it looks like. Uh, Felix has started going into what looks like a, a meditative, like, trance a little bit. Um, didn't, didn't really explain what that is, but uh, outside of that, um, there is still Katarina... Uh, holding uh, onto uh, Captain Hano, and then there is also Aviva um, here as well with the two of you. So I guess just in these, you know, final moments that we have here with Thorn and Eldorus, uh, what do you do? I think I'm laid out on the ground and meander my way over to Hano and Katarina. I think Eldorus, I don't know where she comes from, but I see her swoop down into the general direction of where I'm heading as well. And I begin to assess her state of things. And I'm also kind of internally irritated. I suppose you could say that anyone felt like they could just walk off Mm -hmm. While Hano is in this state. Yeah. You see that uh, Hano is in a... Seems stable. Yeah. Uh, much, uh, much more stable uh, than uh, when you had seen her earlier. Uh, Katarina is still here, mostly just kind of helping support her, but doesn't isn't really putting as much pressure, like, on wounds or anything right, ever right. since... The yeah, since uh, Felix, yeah, cauterized. So she just, you know, but <laughs> Katarina seems more emotionally tired, you know, than anything. Uh, but Hano is like lying there in a, you know, a fever sweat, 
still kind of heavy breathing, adrenaline coming down, and just all around exhausted, you know, both physically and mentally. And, you know, sees you, you know, over there uh, coming and says, that was uh, some good work out there, Thorn. This is, uh, uh, yeah, let me see the wound. And Thorn goes to basically peel peel back uh, Hongo's shirt and see what the what the real damage is here. Yeah. So uh, underneath the shirt, you see the uh, kind of burnt, scarred flesh around the like center of her left lung, uh, like close to where her heart would be, but. If it had been the heart, she yeah. wouldn't be alive anyways. Yeah, exactly. We wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, like, a bit to the left of her heart. And, uh, yeah, you can just see, like, the burnt, like, cr- crisp, like, flesh, essentially, uh, around it. Um, it, I mean, it, it doesn't look great. She's not doing great. She She's stable for now, but her position will... She truly needs to be getting to a doctor yeah. sooner rather than later. And, you know, there's... Yeah, there's there's only so much you can do here. Um, We're not equipped for that. Yeah. So, I mean, she's stable for now, but you don't know how long that's going to last until, you know, there's a, only so long you can live on one lung. Right. And is Hano conscious at all, or is? Yeah, she's 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 kind of fading in and out, but you can tell. Um, all right, I'm gonna try to talk to her then and see what I get back from her. You, you have absolutely no right to be alive. Won't let the naval dogs kick me down. <laughs> never come, never come. That said, you're quite fucked up there, last night. Oh yeah. Bastards got me from behind. Kazarino, do you have any any water or anything? Oh yeah, I um here, yeah, give me a and like goes to uh like dig through uh the pack that uh, you know she brought mm. and hands it to uh to, to Captain Hano. I try to help funnel it into her mouth, uh if she if she struggles with it at all. And it is at that point that uh Thorin kinda ends up uh, collapsing on the ground next to Hano, and it's just, there's a lot of labored breathing. I think uh, Katarina gets up as well and is like, oh, Thorn, not you too. Yeah, oh. and we, we hear, oh, Thorn. There's a guild oh, or Thorn, I, I'm sorry. You set me up to be the lookout. No, but I, you know how it is. As good as me, at the end of the day, no matter how much you're cautious or how much you prepare, it comes for us all. Yeah. I was just hoping that maybe we'd hit our quota for suffering, I guess. <laughs> Not yet. And then from there, we actually see Thorin close his eyes. And, I mean, he he's toast. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's he's been the he has been on the brink. Yeah, you know? so completely understandable. Uh, he should be all right. He's I've seen him worse. He'll be fine. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, I'm sorry that I'm sorry that you'll have to look over them for a while, and you'll have to do it alone. Where are you going? I need to move the book. I don't like how I don't like that we're open. I can fly between the pages. Are you sure about it? I can see the gaps. I can just go get Avery. We can ask. You know, no need to... Don't worry. I'm going to get us somewhere safe. And we see her just fly right up. And Katarina watches as the tiny black dot that flies away uh, becomes smaller and smaller until it is somehow gone. Eldoras, Mm. you are... Flying through a sky of words, floating up here like clouds on invisible strings. These words are handwritten, scrawled. You recognize Avery's uh, handwriting. Mm -hmm. And as you fly higher and higher, 
the words get more dense. The air gets more dense, less like you're flying through the sky, through wind, but more like you're flying through a sheet of silk, of thick fabric, Mm -hmm. getting denser and denser as you get higher, as the words get denser, and you can feel yourself ripping through the pages of this book. You can feel yourself as you tear through its leather binding, its parchment, and you find yourself back in the cave that Aviva blocked off before everybody entered. I think I had been fighting through so intensely that when she shoots out, she kind of shoots herself against a wall a little bit. Goes, ah, ah, And then she immediately looks for a hiding spot to see what she sees before she makes her next move. Um, So right now, uh, the the cave is blocked out uh, on the, like, you can hear, like, on the other side of, like, the rock and rubble of, uh, uh, of the cave, like, the sounds of people still, the sounds of the dragon. Mm -hmm. Really, so you were obscured from all of that. Uh, at the moment, you can hear the raging and roaring of the dragon, who's for sure upset mm. that, you know, it d- didn't get all of you, so it's maybe trying to find a way to dig itself, like, further in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but really, all that's here is the book and the tunnel leading further back into the cave where you found, uh, you, where you all found Aviva, um, and, like, the tunnel where, like, the ship is. Is, that's what's open to me. Yes. The direct path that uh, that goes outside, at least from this entrance, is completely blocked off. Understood. Because that was Aviva's final move before you all entered the the book. Seeing this, Eldorus picks up the book in her claws and flies over to the ship. Mm -hmm. She finds her way down into the bowels of the ship and looks for just just a place no one could ever. Yeah, ever. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's almost, she's hiding it more than she would ever even need to. Mm-hmm. But she, she does so, and she kind of can't help herself, but using what pieces of debris and, and dirt that are around makes a small nest for the book that holds what is most cherished to her. And... She kind of nests down into it on top of it, almost like it's an egg. And that she's all that's in the way between her loved ones in the world. And it's at that moment we see her look up from her nest that she's made and speaks the name Damien. And the moment you speak that name, you feel the room grow warmer as smoke and ash fills this space and his voice seeps in like smoke. Well, well, well. Of all the people I was expecting to call me, you were certainly one of the last. Damien, I want to make a deal. A letter to Alice. My dearest heart, I miss you more and more with every passing day. I wish you were here by my side where you belong. You always know what to do, and I certainly could use your guidance as I continue to encounter situations that truly leave me at a loss. I long to see you and finally make good on the promise I've made you for so many years. This voyage has taken much longer than expected, but once I have what I've come for, nothing will stop me from boarding the first ship back to New Haven even if I have to commandeer one myself. Your patience is a boon I will never be able to repay. I promise this task is well worth it, and our life together will be all the better with this matter settled before I whisk you away. Yours always, Avery. Felix, you are in Avery's constructed version of the Driftwood Cathedral an island in the middle of an endless ocean, overshadowed by the gargantuan, ominous monument. But aside from all of that, your connection to your patron, let's call him, Damien, is weak, especially now that your contract is nearing its end. 
there is uh, only a little bit of his magic still flowing through you. And as you are focusing in on your power, what is it that you do with it? Well, I think here's, here's what one would see, is he's sitting on the beach, eyes closed, and he exhales. And with that exhale comes a cloud of smoke. Certainly not the first time that's ever happened, but this time Felix kind of falls limp and unconscious. And the smoke to anyone else's eyes dissipates. But in reality, the smoke is carrying Felix's soul. And it's carrying it past the realm of this book, past reality, even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And into a dream. What does this dream look like? Right, because the the reading of the the reading of this, right? Uh, you're using uh, uh, Amdusius, which replaces number two on your on your list. So no longer is it, you know, fireballs and stuff. You can enter the dream of someone of someone whose true name you know, but you can sculpt their dreams and implant thoughts, feelings, or visions into their head. So, tell me what this dream looks like, and I will place them somewhere in this dream. Okay, it's a dark room, almost like a like an old cabin, run down and and eerily, eerily quiet. And there's there's a fireplace where a small fire is is uh, is 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 going, and and there are two just old wooden chairs next to the fireplace. Felix is sitting in one of them, and. Uh, the way that Felix appears in this dream is not too unlike how he normally looks, except he is wearing a cloak made of black smoke. And he is wearing uh, one, of the, one of the masks that he often wears. But in this dream, it is constantly shifting in shape and color and design. Ooh, that's really good. I love this. And sitting across from you in the other chair is concert master Cassius Morrigan III. He is this tall, lean man. He's not broad and intimidating in the way that a lot of people of power tend to try to hold themselves, you know? There is this broad-shouldered, you know, muscle-bound, uh, or even, like, you know, sculpted uh, man in front of you. There is this well-kept, dark brown uh, beard and mustache, like, kind of sculpted into, like, a goatee, uh, almost. There isn't even, like, the shadow of uh, of growth, like over time, right? Like, like perfectly shaven, clean hair, perfectly coiffed, and wearing these extravagant clothes of like silk, and with a, a blue gold vest and perfectly tailored pants. Everything on him looks as if it were, and it probably is, perfectly made for. There is not a fold or crease out of place. His eyes are calculating and discernful, analyzing every bit of you and kind of getting almost kind of caught in a moment in the ever-shifting mass that you're aware of, the one part that he cannot seem to discern, your identity. I think there's this moment where, at one point, this place did not exist, and now it does and the two of you are here. And there's almost, like, not this feeling of, like, surprise coming from him, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. He almost seems to, like, there's this moment where, like, he looks around, realizes that he's in this place, but, like, nothing about his body tells you that he is uncomfortable or confused. 
He is in almost full control over his mannerisms and looks around and says, and who are you? Felix smiles. He says, Hello, Morrigan. You wouldn't know me by any name that has any meaning to you. Speak your business, then. You who have called me here. I know not by what means, but I'm more than familiar with your ilk. Those of you work in dreamscapes and magic. You can drop the act, Cassius. If I may call you that. You may not. You sit here before Concertmaster Cassius Morrigan III. And while I know you know that, I don't think you know. I'm familiar with how dreamscapes work. And he folds his legs over. You cannot harm me while we are here, so any threat of violence means nothing. Now, I don't know who you work for or what you think you're doing, but I will hear you out before I decide what to do with you. Oh, there's no need to worry about little old me. I'm not here as an adversary, concertmaster. <laughs> Allies usually don't hide themselves behind shifting masks and appear in dreams. Usually there's a gift up front, perhaps money, women, food artifacts, anything. You invite me to a cabin with a fire, not even a meal for us to share a conversation. What do you have to offer me, if not a threat? I'm not an ally either, Morgan. Think of me as, well, let's just say I know a little bit more about you than you think. You, you think yourself a uh, Man of faith, do you? I don't think I know. But you've been consorting with very unholy sorts. Uh-huh. Is that what this is? Blackmail? You're trying to get some confession out of me that I'm working with what? Pirate? Spirit? Devil? Demon? Not blackmail, no. More... Words of encouragement, because I know, I know you've dipped your toes into the truth. And I know, deep in your heart, you're figuring it out. That church of yours, the first song, it's a lie. And you know it's a lie, because you've seen the truth. That which signals, and that which conceals. I think with that, you notice, for the first time in this conversation, the even, like, hint of a twitch from him. What do you want? I want to encourage you to pursue greater things than this church of yours. I think... A man of your quality would be well suited for seeking the truth. You think truth is what I'm after? A man such as me is worth far greater, nor do I need your encouragement to do so. So I will ask you again, what is it that you want? For now, why don't you just give him a message for me? Tell him, Lunulata says hi. And who is this him? Felix gestures to the smoke rising out of the fire. Mm -hmm. And he says, do I need to mention a name? He looks over to the fire where you gesture and the smoke pouring out of it. Did he send you a messenger of his? I wouldn't say I work for him anymore, but we are well acquainted. I won't presume to ask how you know of my connection, nor will I ask how you yourself broke yours. I will deliver your name, but in return, who are you? You know me and our mutual friend, but I don't know you. As I said, I... I'm Lunulata. Any other name 
that one would call me is that of a dead man. Lunula, you have the tone of Marvelin to continue to desecrate the mask as he gazes upon your ever-shifting mask. Mm-hmm. All right, then, Lunula, I'll deliver your message. Thank you, concert master. Remember, I don't have to be your enemy. But if you make one of me, I will respond in turn. Of course. Who needs an enemy when there could be a friend? And I think he reaches his hand out to you. Felix smiles and starts to reach a hand out. But instead of actually shaking his hand, Felix's sort of cloak of smoke starts to extend out from his hand and begins to wrap itself around Cassius Morgan's arm and moving up and slowly enveloping him. And Felix says, Oh, but remember, I'm not a friend either. And the dream starts to dissolve as he's enveloped in smoke. A letter to Everett. Brother, it's about father. I know we've suspected things, but I have sources who find he is hunting the same knowledge we are. He is after the notes I've compiled. I have always been protective of them, but never truly considered how valuable they could be or what they could possibly do in the wrong hands. I will also enclose a sketch of a celestial arrowhead that I unfortunately used up in my pursuits. I feel I have learned so much and yet nothing at all at the same time. You know... It sent me back to a moment in our past to test me, and I failed so thoroughly I'm ashamed. I watched by silently again as you were cast out from our family for something you could not control, much less should have to. The things you said that night, I wish... I wish I could be strong enough to do something then or now, to do more than send you aid clandestinely. I'm sorry I continued to fail you. Someday I hope to be brave the way you were. But until we have our evidence, our redemption, I shall continue to play the quiet, pleasant, forgotten son, living contently in all your shadows. Father's power grab continues to go according to plan. If Vi's bow were not actually so good to her, I would object on principle, but they do seem a good match. I continue to keep her alert, especially with upcoming arrangements and binding vows. May the goddess keep you always. I will keep you abreast of any new information. Alistair. Whew. All right, everybody. How was that? We did it! We're, We're done! done. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> We're done! Loisimos. <laughs> we did it. It doesn't it feel it like we're done. done. That doesn't feel... Yeah, right? Yeah, it's a it's a kind of an Empire Strikes Back kind of ending, where it's like, oh man, nothing's really resolved. Mm. We're like all okay, but like... <laughs> I mean, that's what we do best. <laughs> There's still shit. Isn't that, that's isn't, true. isn't that what we do best? That is kind of what we do best. Uh, thank you all so much for being here uh, for our last price, our last episode. Wow. Uh, Whispers in the Sea Gang, that was it. Or that was season one of it. Thank you for also waiting for so long for this finale to like finally happen. I know we took several weeks off just because life uh, was not very kind to really any of us uh, during that period of time. I'm so excited to be able to sit here with my friends and play these little games and tell these little stories with them. As always, I'm, I'm so grateful for everyone uh, for, for being here, playing with me, but also for all of you for listening to our show. Uh, it genuinely means so much to me, specifically. I can't speak for anyone else. Thanks so much. Any of you all have any last words to say to people? I don't know. I just I hope that you liked our little journey. I hope that you appreciated uh, the way that all of our characters grew and changed. Yeah, right? Thank you for being with us on this wild little ride. It's just really nice to know that other people connect with our story. And the moral of the story for, for this arc was 
Don't, uh, don't smoke. Don't. <laughs> don't, don't smoke. smoke. <laughs> don't. You can extrapolate. Maybe yeah, do read books. I think don't yes, smoke. read books. Books was good. Mm, pro library, anti smoking. Don't sell your secrets to demons. Pro church. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> If you got a pro church message out of all of this, I really need you all to go back to the first episode and start listening Read all the way that. through. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You know, there's no point in, in doing this. We will have a post. Uh, we will have a post season wrap up uh, at some point. Uh, check out uh, our Twitter, X. Our, our X, uh, Instagram, <laughs> Tumblr, and Blue Sky uh, uh, for <laughs> for uh, information about that. Uh, we'll uh, you all will be able to send us questions about the season. Uh, we'll also also tie in Strangers in the Wood as well because we didn't have a postseason wrap up for that, uh, so we can kind of mix these things together. And uh, you all can yeah talk to us, ask us questions about production, about stories, about characters, whatever you want, you know. So uh, Gus, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on the internet at August underscore Nobby. That's K N O B B E. You can also follow my band. I believe our uh, Instagram is Spunk Band. If all goes right, we will we will we will have a single out. We're gonna be having a having a single out on on Spotify. Yo, and you know it's a band effort, but like I did write the song and record the vocals, so you know. Big Gus effort. Big, Big I, Gus effort. I put a lot of effort into it. I'll admit. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, nothing wrong with admitting that. BGE. That, that big, BGE. <laughs> BGE. <laughs> that big Gus effort. Amazing. Hilda, where can people, I guess I said it earlier, but you can say it again. Where can people find this podcast on the internet? You can find us on Twitter. Yes, Twitter. Um, and <laughs> Instagram and Tumblr. And if you follow the bios in, I think, any of those places, you can come hang out with us on Discord. Yeah! Come hang out! Come on! It's fun here. Playing with us. Uh, Ellis, where can people find you? You can find me on the Bird Corpse at <laughs> Horror Writer, spelled W-H-O-R-E underscore or underscore the word writer until it has decomposed onto a point that I can no longer exist on it. Uh, fair enough. Fair, so fair and so true. Hey, uh, Marcy, where can people find you on the internet? Dude, this is crazy, dude. You can you can find me on twitter.com at chipped canine. Um, yeah. Other than that, I mean, you to astral project to find me. And as always, you can find me on X, Blue Sky, Ooh. Hive. <laughs> I'm not on. I'm not on Hive. Uh, you can find me anywhere that matters uh, at Kendo Makes Films, including Omega Strikers. Let's go. Uh, still out there, Juno Mains. Rise up. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. And as always, don't forget to go out. Eat enough food, drink enough water, get enough sleep, and take care of yourself because self-care is very important, especially in the times we're living in now. And don't forget to love yourself like we love you. Bye. Bye, gamers. Bye,
proud member of the Rainbow Roll Network. Rainbow Roll. Our stories, our voices.